Well, let's think about where we are in the book of Romans. The book of Romans in chapter 8 has been focusing on this remarkable work of the Spirit of God. We have gone from chapter 7, where we saw really those that have been redeemed out of the world are yet in a time of tension, in a place where we are at war with the flesh and spirit, and there is still this ongoing battle. There's the principle of the inner man, and yet there is the principle of indwelling sin, or as Paul says in chapter 7, uh, verse 21, sin that lies close by. And so we are still in this world, in this life, in a time of tension, and you and I desperately need the work of the Spirit in our lives. And this is what Paul calls walking by the Spirit, being led by the Spirit. And that's what he says here, that the children of God are those that are led by the Spirit. And so we're going to take at least two weeks to look at the doctrine of adoption. And today, I want to just walk through uh, a couple of things. Uh, the identity of the sons of God. also want to look at the liberty of the sons of God. And then last of all, I want to consider the doctrine of election in terms of what does it mean to be adopted as a child of God. So the uh, identity, the liberty, and the adoption of, this, of the children of God. That's what we'll be at. As you can tell from verse 14, the Apostle Paul begins, first and foremost, by distinguishing who are the children of God. And he says, those that are the children of God are those that are led by the Spirit of God. Now, we looked at this verse, you remember, last week. So this is not Pastor Emilio, you forgot you did this verse last week. By the way, I love those kind of saints that are so meticulous, they can come up to me and say, uh, Pastor, uh, excuse me, um, let me bother you for a moment. Yeah, uh, you did that last week. What happened? <laughs> I like that. That means you're paying attention. You know where I left off. You are tracking with the exposition, and that's greatly encouraging. No, this is not a mistake, but it is a little bit of redundancy for the sake of the context. Because these principles that are given to us here in Romans 8, in this section, they are only for the children of God. It's not for anybody else. Uh, the children of God are those who have the mark of the Spirit. Those who have the mark of the Spirit, or we could put it, those who have the work of the Spirit. Those that have the characteristics of the Spirit in operation in their life. And here, it is described as being led by the Spirit. You remember last week, we tried to kind of take this out of the realm of the subjective, out of the realm of the emotional necessarily, out of the realm, let's just kind of you know, get right to some of the great errors of today, but out of the realm of some kind of hyper-Pentecostal, charismatic understanding of the Spirit's work in your life. So as to say, unless you have some kind of emotional, ecstatic, supernatural experience, then the Spirit is not working in your life. Quite to the contrary, the Spirit is working in your life in the rough edges of your life. The Spirit is working in your life in the wildernesses of your life. The Spirit is at work in your life in the trenches of your life, in the nitty-gritty of life. That is where the Spirit shows up. The Spirit is not located mainly, you know, when the worship music is good and the concert is good, and everyone is shouting at the top of their lungs and screaming the latest contemporary music song. That's fine, but understand the, the, the real work, the real sanctification probably doesn't happen when you're at a Christian concert. <laughs> it probably happens Monday morning on your way to work, and that person cuts you off, or you got there late, and the boss yells at you, and you had a terrible day, or you injured yourself on the job, or whatever it may be. It's in real life that the Spirit and His operations are mostly detected by the believer. And so when it says you are led by the Spirit, it is no different than what Paul has already talked about in terms of walking by the Spirit. And if you go back to verses 4 and 5, what it means to live according to the Spirit, it is this activity. 
And as we, lo- we already looked at, because this whole chapter is about the Spirit, this activity begins at regeneration. In other words, it begins at the new birth. This is the reason why, brothers and sisters, the world and, ge- and society in general cannot simply lift Christian language off of the Bible and use it for their own lives therapeutically, psychologically, or in any other way. The Bible is not there for the world's sentimental amusement. The Bible is not there just to impart moralistic principles for society at large. You see this everywhere in our culture today. But more specifically, this whole idea of the Spirit's activity in the life of a believer, the person that uh, Paul here identifies as the sons of God, begins with the principle of the new birth, regeneration, which is what? It is a supernatural birth from above. It is a being made alive. It is a spiritual resurrection. It is a spiritual baptism. It is a spiritual circumcision. It's a spiritual renewal. It's a spiritual vivification. You are made alive. You were dead. You were in judgment. You were in sin. You were under God's wrath. And God made you alive in Jesus Christ. Paul calls that in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, a transformation. A transformation. And that's exactly what it is. The picture of this transformation and this work of the Spirit in regeneration, I think, is depicted perhaps best in a picture at Lazarus' tomb. Where Lazarus, if you haven't read John 11 in a while, Jesus in the context says four times, Lazarus is dead. A few verses later, Lazarus is dead. A few verses later, Lazarus is dead. And because people are hard of hearing, Lazarus is dead. Four times. And the person he meets when he arrives, Lazarus' sister, still doesn't understand. And says, Lord, if you'd just been here, my brother would not have died. Where were you? You ever felt like that for God? Where were you in my circumstance? Why did you show up so late? I don't understand. Why would you work in this way? Why would you do it this way? Why would you wait until my child was full grown and out of the house and went through all this garbage and then eventually save them? Maybe. Why are you working this way? Why aren't you saving my spouse, my children? Why aren't you providing the kind of money you know I want? The kind of lifestyle I want. Why aren't you working in my circumstances the way I would want you to work? The way you're working, apparently, in these people over here. It's all of that. Christian life is very simple in some sense, right? Trust. Faith. Believe. And Lazarus' sister did not believe. Remember? He said, if you just would have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And Jesus says, I'm the resurrection and the life. Now, the Gospel of John is unique. It's known for a double entendre, which means there are times where you read out of the Gospel of John and the intent is for the reader or for the audience. But the Gospel of John is designed in such a way that when you read it, it's talking right to you. So when Jesus tells her, do you believe this? It is designed by the Holy Spirit of God to be asking the reader, do you believe this? Jesus is the resurrection and the life. He makes people alive. It is His power, His Word, and as we're learning here in Romans 8, His Spirit that gives us life as we are put in union with Jesus Christ. And therefore, from regeneration, where a person is made alive, to then a person putting their faith, putting their trust. You ever witness to somebody and you tell them, you just need to believe, right? 
You ever witness to somebody and tell them, if you just had faith in Jesus, and if you tell them that, you are right. But what you must do is then go behind your closet door and pray, oh God, give that person the ability to believe. Because that person does not have what it takes to muster up saving faith. Saving faith is a gift. And those that are led by the Spirit of God have been made alive by the Spirit of God. He has animated them spiritually. He has awakened them. And those that have been made alive, given faith to believe in Jesus, to believe on His cross, have been justified, declared righteous in the sight of God. They've gone from enmity, where they're hostile to God, enemies of God, there's a war with God, to peace with God, reconciliation with God. As Jesus says, I no longer call you servants, I now call you friends. You are friends of God through Jesus Christ. And those who have been justified are then immediately what? Adopted into his family. God doesn't adopt guilty, wrath-deserving sinners into his family. He first has to justify them. He first has to declare them righteous. Before he adopts you, he has to change your status. He's not adopting enemies. He's adopting those that have been made righteous in the sight of God through justifying grace. And on the basis of that righteousness, which is not your righteousness, it's the righteousness of God that comes by faith in Jesus Christ, then those are the proper recipients of the grace of sonship. You know the word adoption in the Bible? Huthesios just means sonship. It has the word huyas, son. We are all sons in the sun. Matter of fact, David Garland has written a, song, uh, written a book called Sons in the Sun. Beautiful book on union with Jesus Christ and what it means to be found in him. And this language of sonship is what carries the context all the way through to the end here, all the way to verse 17, and then even from there, into the future eschatological implications of our adoption. But this language of adoption, this language of sonship, it is stressing to us that we have now a new status in Christ where we are now part of God's family and that we are now inheritors of all of the privileges that come to a natural son. This is why, of course, Paul will identify us as fellow heirs of Christ. We are in Christ. We are adopted in Christ. And we have been given the privileges of Christ. Just like Jesus told his disciples in, in uh, Luke, Luke chapter 22, verse 28 and 29, he tells them, Just as the Father has granted to me or covenanted to me, he has granted in a covenant agreement, a covenant bond. He has granted to me a kingdom, so too I grant you a kingdom. You see? So the same kingdom that God promised to his own natural, non-adopted son, because it is his natural son, the son that he begat through eternal generation in in the Godhead, the processions of the Godhead, The eternal Son of God and His kingdom has become our kingdom. His inheritance is our inheritance. And so Jesus says, Revelation chapter 2, if you overcome, which means by faith, if you trust in the gospel, if you endure to the end as to be saved, He will give you the right to sit on His throne. You want to talk about humbling? You want to talk about a glorious new reality that has obtained? 
You and I are at a great disadvantage living in the 21st century. We have had over a century now, almost two centuries now, of the heresy of evolution. And the heresy of evolution is wrong, well, for many reasons. But one of the reasons it's wrong is because it teaches materialism. The only thing that is real is what's material. Your body, your bones, the pulpit, Bibles, the floor. That's it. It was Darwin's way of eliminating the idea of God, the soul, religion, spirits, heaven, hell, afterlife, angels, everything. And so what that produced in the world is a secular worldview, a secular mind that only lives for this eminent world that you see around you and does not live at all as if the biblical world you teach is. In a very short while, for some of you shorter than some of us, your life will issue forth in eternal joy or eternal misery. And so this eschatological, spiritual worldview has been literally stripped out of our society, stripped out of our culture. And that's why you see the heinous things that you see all over the media, all over the culture, all over the news, all over you know, what's going on in entertainment, and education, and everything else. Now, God has given us an eternal inheritance as His people, as His children. We are those that are led by the Spirit of God, and in that way we have been distinguished as the children of God. The Spirit's operations is in us. We looked at this last time, remember, but this is something like what you find in Galatians chapter 5. All this means is that the marks of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, is activated in your life so that you bear out the virtues of the Spirit love, patience, peace, kindness, gentleness, those things, goodness. Those things flow out of the life of the adopted child of God who is led by the Spirit of God. You will have those characteristics. Listen, not just because patience is automatically a virtue that you are saved. Some of the most wicked people in the world are some of the most patient people. They patiently wait for their wicked schemes and plans to come about. You can be patient. You could show kindness. I used to say this on a college campus. Don't try to impress God with your virtue. Don't forget that Adolf Hitler had a pet that he loved. He had a German shepherd. He would pet it and show kindness to it. Okay, so if Adolf Hitler, whose nature is no different than anyone else's outside of Christ, But he, being evil, is capable of virtuous actions. The operation of the Spirit is different. This is a Spirit-wrought work because when you, as a Christian, as a child of God, manifest the fruit of the Spirit, you do it unto the glory of God. And the world does not. You do it for God's sake, for Christ's sake, and the world does not is simply incapable of doing that. This is a beautiful thing, uh, verse 14, and I would tell you today, tomorrow, underline that, circle it, write it down. All who are led by the Spirit are sons of God. If you don't see the question mark that I see, just take your, you know, I don't write in my Bible, but just for, for imagination's sake here, Let's all just put a big permanent marker question mark over this verse to ask the question, am I led by the Spirit? Because if it is, because if if I am, then I have the glorious assurance, I am a child of God. But if you're not led by the Spirit, if you don't see the operations of the Spirit in your life, if there's no manifestation of the work of the Spirit in your life, then you need to be troubled today. Because this brings into question, are you even a child of God or not? I think it's just remarkable that we just skip over that so quickly. 
But this passage goes on, doesn't it? The Apostle Paul is going to move on from that remarkable declaration, that demarcation, that distinguishing identification of the sons of God to now begin to elaborate how that works. He says, you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom you cry, Abba, Father. Now, you have a translation. Well, you have an interpretation decision to make based on your translation. In verse 15, when it says, you have received the spirit of adoption, either your Bible has a lowercase s, spirit of adoption, or capitalized S, as in Holy Spirit of adoption. And one speaks of a mindset, a disposition, like a principle that governs your soul. The other one speaks of the Holy Spirit. Now the ESV, I believe, has translated it rightly by capitalizing the word spirit so that the spirit of of adoption is the Holy Spirit inside of us. And this Holy Spirit, of course, is contrasted with the spirit of slavery. What is the spirit of slavery? When Paul says, you did not receive the spirit of slavery, what's he talking about? He's talking about the enslavement and the bondage and the spiritual demise of those he's been describing in chapter 6, chapter 7, leading up to chapter 8, as what? As those who are in the flesh. Where does he say that? Verse 9. You are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. Now those who have a spirit of slavery are in the flesh. And what are they enslaved to? They are enslaved to sin, of course. Hebrews chapter 2 tells us they're also enslaved to the fear of death. And isn't that remarkable that here it says that we are not in slavery to fall back into fear. At the end of the day, this fear is the fear of judgment. See, the spirit of slavery is the spirit of estrangement. You don't know God. It's a spirit of an alienation. You're outside of God. Uh, like Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, you are... You are without God in the world and without hope. The spirit of of enslavement or the spirit of slavery here is indicative of those who are still under the tyranny and dominion of sin. It characterizes this fear, in other words, as the kind of fear that leads you away from God, not to God. That's the spirit that he's dealing with here. And if you have this spirit, guess what happens? You are tempted to go within. You are tempted to look to yourself. You are tempted to recoil away from God and not cast yourself down at the mercy of God. Do you fear God today? I tell you, brothers and sisters, the contemporary Christian church, one of the most neglected doctrines in all of the church is the fear of God. Um, I was talking to a friend here the other day, and I told him of the propensity of contemporary churches today to use the word Jesus. You seen this? Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. We're here so that you can meet with Jesus. We want you to have a close walk with Jesus. We want to introduce you to Jesus. And I'm like, okay, I agree. You know what can happen there, if you're not careful, as I've noticed? Is that you take Lord out of his name. You know, I did the study because I got so curious, and I have Bible Logos computer software. I can do it in a click. I looked it up. The apostles did not run around mainly saying Jesus on their lips. Am I saying you can't say I can't say Jesus? Of course not. But they so feared God, I believe, that it was, it, was actually, it was actually abnormal for them to not say Jesus without saying, Lord Jesus, or Lord Jesus Christ, or simply Lord. 
or simply Christ. But it's not the most often to hear the apostles say, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. I know you want people to be disarmed. I know you don't want to scare people away. I know you think that saying Jesus a million times during a church service is more welcoming. And it's just like getting to know someone. But don't strip him of his lordship. Because the child of God is always to operate under the fear of God. Right? What does the Apostle Paul say? Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord. And you know that that reference to the Lord is Jesus. When was the last time these, you know, these kind of church presentations say that? We want to introduce you to the terror of Jesus. You're not going to hear a whole lot of that. Believers live under the fear of God. But that fear for us, beloved, is not the fear of a monster. It's not the fear of a judge. It's not the fear of an executioner who's out to get us. It is the fear of His absolute holiness. It is the fear of His absolute goodness and grace. Because we are still sinners, we know that God is supremely holy, that we are undeserving, and that under His sovereignty and under His power and His glory and wisdom and might, oh, we should still be catapulted to cast ourselves down at the feet of God under the fear of God. Are you a prophet of God? I'm not. I know there's people running around saying they're prophets. They're not. All the prophets are right here. Okay, right here. And we get to see one of these prophets. We get to see a lot of the prophets under the fear of God. Do you remember Isaiah? I mean, think about this. I want you to really think about this. Like Jeremiah, Isaiah, God is telling them, I'm going to send you. You're going to go prophesy. Basically, you're going to go preach. You're going to go give a message to Israel, to the rulers, the kings, the judges, the people in authority, all the influential people in the culture everywhere in Israel. You are going to be my mouthpiece. You're going to speak. And you know what they're going to do to you? They're going to kill you. Jeremiah said, or God said to Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 1, he's going to set the whole nation against him. And do you think, therefore, that we would look at Isaiah as a holy man of God, stood against the tide, stood against evil, stood against corruption, stood against all the folly of a whole nation that was involved in false worship, false idolatry? But we know that Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6 is caught up in the Spirit. He's taken up into the heavenly realms. He's brought into the heaven temple and he sees the throne in heaven. And what does he do? But instantly he says, Woe is me. He pronounces a judgment on himself. He says, basically, I ain't got what it takes to be here. I'm standing in my own two feet. I'm thrust on the floor. He starts basically covering himself in dust and ashes, basically saying, look, I, I'm unclean. And I'm surrounded by unclean people. Basically what he was saying is, my sin has made me tremble in the presence of the holiness of God that I see. And it required what? It required an act by God, from the throne, from the altar, by the angels, to cleanse Isaiah symbolically, okay? because he wasn't made perfect in that moment. It was symbolic. It was a vision to him to show him, unless God in heaven cleanses you, you can't stand before him in his throne. We all have to fear God. You know, God-fearing people, that's a sad cliche in our culture, but for those who are the children of God, it is absolutely true. We fear. And so what is the spirit of adoption? It is the Holy Spirit. 
who has set then his work in our lives by adopting us in set in complete opposition to the spirit of slavery. What does that mean? Well, it's what Paul says, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. There is freedom. We have been liberated. And this liberty is absolutely glorious. Maybe not what you think. Turn back there again, Romans chapter 8. Look at verse 17 again. He says, look, you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Now, this is one of the reasons why I take it as Holy Spirit, capital S, not lower cap or lowercase s, as describing some kind of disposition or mindset. Because he says, by whom? <laughs> so then you would have to also then translate the relative clause or the relative pronoun here by which but I don't think that's right I think this is much more in the realm of a personal pronoun describing the third person of the Godhead the spirit so that by the spirit we can cry out Abba Father and and doesn't it fit the context if, if you look you know at verse 26, let's just look there real quick, right? You kind of have the same thing there, kind of a parallel idea. He says, likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. There's the by whom right there. The by whom is the Spirit. He helps us. We don't even know what to pray. We don't even know how to pray as we ought to pray. But the Spirit Himself, there it is, He intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts knows what is the mind of the oh, excuse me, and he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the spirit, namely God. God searches the hearts and he knows the mind or thoughts of the spirit. And so when the spirit intercedes for us and communicates as it were to the father our groaning interprets our groaning, our pain, our anguish, and I hope you groan. I hope you groan. And I hope that as you groan, you recognize that groaning that no one around you can necessarily fully, completely, thoroughly understand. You ever felt misunderstood? No one knows your pain. No one knows your complaint. No one knows your situation. No one knows your anguish. Thanks be to God. Paul says the Spirit he can translate our pain and he communicates it to the Father in the plainest language. And of course, there's a bit of an anthropomorphism here, isn't there? Because the question, if you're real slick theologically, if you want to be real slick, you can say, well, doesn't God know that already? Why does God need interpretation? He is showing you the inner workings of the Godhead and how the whole Godhead works in concert in the, in the whole enterprise of Christian worship and communion. In the depth of your heart. Tom Pennington was probably groaning, laying on that bed, in anguish in the hospital. Why? Because he's a human being. Just a man. I know he pastors a huge church, and people think people like that are celebrities or whatever. He's just a man. He's just a sinner. And I know, I know, I know because I know Tommy loves his family, loves his daughters, loves his wife, loves his family, loves his church. And you better believe he was laying there in anguish, groaning, crying out to God, though no one could hear him. But the Spirit heard him. And the Spirit interpreted his thoughts to the Father. And because of the Holy Spirit, we have this glorious intercession. We have this glorious access. Because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. You know, when you intercede for somebody, you ask something on their behalf, right? You know the Spirit will never ask the Father anything for you that is not His will. The Spirit will never encounter a no to his prayer for you. The Spirit will always be in harmony with the Father's will. That's so beautiful. 
And so the Spirit will only intercede for you that which is right, not that which you want. Not that which you and all of your collective wisdom think that you need. But that which is in complete harmony with the absolute will and decree of God. Let's get down to brass tacks. There's only one will being accomplished in this world. And it's not yours. It's God's will and His decree. This, this, this assumes that you have the kind of worldview where you put God first. He is ultimate. And when you put God first, because you see how holy He is, how righteous He is, how wise He is, how glorious He is, when you see what is glorious before you, you realize you don't have any glory at all. Right? You realize in comparison to God, like kind of like Isaiah. I'm sure people respected Isaiah. He's a prophet. But when he stood before the holiness of God, he said, woe is me. He says, I am undone. I'm finished. I'm history. I'm nothing. And you think Isaiah would not want to be where he was? I bet you Isaiah wanted to stay there in that glory realm. I bet you Isaiah wanted to stay in front of the God he so feared. Because it's so glorious to behold. See, this gives us access. The Spirit grants us this unmitigated access. And this results in you communing with God as your Father. Let's read it again. You receive the Spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. I was tempted because I was running out of time preparing for this. When I got to Abba, Father, I thought, oh boy, this is its own sermon. I, I, there's so many things, but what kind of cry is this? Well, first and foremost, brothers and sisters, it is the cry of intimacy. It is the cry of relation. It is the cry of familiarity. We know Him. He knows us. We have access to Him. He is our Father. We are no longer estranged. We no longer have the spirit of slavery, bondage, leading to fear, meaning ungodly fear. We have now the spirit of adoption. And by God's Spirit, we cannot cry out to God on the basis of salvation. We have been saved. We have been saved. We have been saved. And we can now, out of the depth of our heart, we can actually flee to Him as our Father. Go, 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 go cower there. You know, to, to tell you, people, to don't get in a fetal position and give up in life. <laughs> Okay, can I get in a fetal position and give up to God? Because that's where I want to be. I want to be hid in Him, in the cleft of the rock. I want to be under His care, His supervision. I want to be, I want to be under His sovereignty, His sovereignty and His grace. I want to be under His hand, in His hand. It's also the cry of thanksgiving. That's what the Spirit does. The Spirit makes us grateful, thankful when we approach the Father. We've already looked. It's also a cry of weakness. Look at verse 26 one more time. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. Underline singular noun, weakness, not weaknesses. As in, oh, if you knew my weaknesses, you know. I have this problem and this sin and that problem, this temptation, and I have this propensity and that propensity. It's not what he's talking about. When he says weakness singular, he is saying your human frame, your condition, the totality of who you are right now, you are in a weakened state. You have limitations, physical, mental, spiritual, emotional. You are, you're limited. You're weak. And the Spirit helps you with your weakness. And this cry, unlike the cry of so many brothers and sisters, 
in this world. Oh, I can't even think of the misery. I can't even think of the misery of what's going on right now in this world. It's just insane. It doesn't matter who's right, who's wrong. When you see wars and rumors of wars, when you see what's going on in Israel or Ukraine or whatever, and you see these people blowing themselves to smithereens, and you see, and I, I, I've seen the hard footage, the really hard footage of Palestinian children buried under rubble, crying out for help. Oh, it's just this world is awful. And the cries that ascend out of this fallen, broken world. Think about, you want to start talking about privilege, beloved? It is only the cry of the children of God that are heard and received and accepted by God. Our cry is the cry of hope. Some people cry out in anguish in this world and they're hopeless. They're absolutely hopeless without Christ. We pray that their cry will be the cry of repentance, don't we? That they would cry out for mercy perhaps and get grace. I have several close people in my life over the years that have died and I've prayed, God, I pray that in their final hour they cried out to you in repentance. But I don't know. Only God knows that. And so it's critically important, beloved, to understand that our adoption, your adoption in Christ is the result of the absolute sovereign grace of God. He adopts us. We don't adopt Him. It's like the Bible saying, He chose us. What did Jesus say? I chose you. You did not choose me. Remember the children of Israel, Deuteronomy chapter Seven, I think it is. I did not choose you because X, Y, and Z. Because you were so great and talented and you had such remarkable people in your nation. He says, I chose you because I chose you. I chose you because I love you. (laughs) That's it. And we are just left with that. God is His own referential. I am that I am. I have mercy on whom I have mercy. God is in His own reference point. He doesn't, he doesn't do things because we motivate Him to do things. God is not like us. He is not affected passively by external forces. All that He does, He does within Himself in the execution of His perfect plan and decree because of His perfect being. Adoption is not just a work of grace. As we've learned, it is a work of the Spirit. But even more so, it is the work of the triune God, is it not? Let me read to you Galatians chapter 4, verse 6. One verse on adoption. And the Apostle Paul puts the entire Trinity there. He says, Because you are sons, God, the Father, has sent the Spirit, the Spirit, of His Son, the Son, into our heart, crying out, Abba, Father. There's Galatians again serving as a Parallel to the book of Romans, right? Kind of as the cliff notes, a cheat sheet. Oh, and guess what? It is the Spirit's work. You see that? Just like here. It's not lowercase s, capital S. I think that's remarkably great. What do we walk away from in terms of the spirit of adoption? What are some practical things that we can take away given our lives, given our situations, whatever they may be? Let me give you a couple. Number one, unlike the world of unbelief, God is not just your creator and your judge. God is your Father. That's your association to Him. It is a filial, familial fatherhood that is bestowed upon you through adoption. You have been brought into the Father's house. You have been made part of His household. 
He is your loving, heavenly Father. I don't know when it happened for me, but uh, as I was studying, oh, I think it was the Gospel of Luke and the Lord's Prayer, amazing that Jesus taught His disciples, pray like this, Heavenly Father, hallowed be Thy name. And from then on, I really have never, I don't pray without acknowledging the Father because it keeps me accountable. Father, Son, Spirit. Not in the sense of one's more important than the other, but that each one plays a critical, distinct role in my spiritual life. I don't want to, you know, rag on the Jesus, Jesus, Jesus people, but but that's kind of another part you miss, right? And pastors get on stage and they say, okay, let's pray. Jesus. Is there anything wrong with that technically? No. But we have a triune God. And Jesus instructed us, pray to the Father. Because as you pray to the Father, your own mind is being instructed in the Gospel. The Gospel is not just about Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. The Gospel is about Jesus being sent by the Father and the the Son pouring out the Spirit on His people. It's more comprehensive than that. The doctrine of adoption also tells us not only that God is our Father, we're in His family, we are, we are brothers and sisters in Christ, but we also therefore belong. So a sense of belonging, as opposed to a sense of estrangement or a sense of loneliness. Do you know, I was listening to the sermon where this pastor was talking about the epidemic of loneliness in the world. Everyone, despite the fact that you have a screen in front of you connecting you to billions of people, social media everywhere, where you have you know, the, the instantaneous ability to go and reach someone at any moment. There's an epidemic of loneliness. People feel estranged, lonely, uh, unconnected, unattached, untethered. Like they don't have community. And tragically, This is prevalent in the church where people are in churches. I had a friend tell me this not long ago. He's in a massive church with 2,000 people and he tells me his wife has virtually made no friends. What is wrong with us? What's wrong with us is that we have failed to recognize that we were adopted not just to talk to God, but we were adopted to talk to each other. To connect to the family of God. And while people suffer with loneliness and estrangement, adoption reminds us we belong to the greatest society, the greatest community of all, because we belong to the family of God. And the doctrine of of adoption, therefore, also speaks of our absolute ownership, meaning God owns you legally. You go adopt a child right now, you go through the process, you go through the the test period they put you through, and you fill out all the paperwork and all that. But once that stamp is done, boom, they're out of there, you have the child, it is yours. By law, you are that person's father, mother, and that child is is your child. That's their parent now. Done. And so you, you and I who have been adopted into the family of God, we are legally owned by God now. We are His property, His responsibility. It is His responsibility to take care of us. And that should be a great comfort to you. It means that our parental supervision is the rock of ages. The one who will never fail us, he is completely sovereign and wise in all of his dealings with his children. And unlike earthly parents who do their best, we try, but we often fail. We try, but our counsel is not always right. We try, but sometimes our discipline is harsh. We try, but sometimes we're motivated not out of goodness, but out of anger and frustration and selfishness. God parents us with a perfect, loving, fatherly hand. The doctrine of adoption also assures us that God's 
authority and discipline is not only formidable, but it is gracious, good, and wise. We need it. You want to understand the discipline of God? Look at Hebrews 12. It has as much to do with what He does formally in your life to actually build you up as it does to correct you. You think of discipline, be honest, you think of discipline, you think of a spanking. (laughs) But really, the Greek word in the New Testament for discipline means something like training. Training. And isn't that part of real healthy parenting? You're not just saying no all the time, right? God forbid, I remember talking with, uh, uh, who was it, Paul Washer, and he told me that as a parent, that's one of the big lessons that he learned as a dad, is he just kept telling his kids no to everything. No, you can't do that, it's carnal. No, you can't do that, it's Disney, or whatever. You know, no, you can't do that because, you know, you, you can't spend time on the internet, or no, you can't watch that movie or that it's got blasphemy in it, you know. And and he suddenly realized, man, what am I telling my kids they can do? So he got them involved in all sorts of activities and things and tried to channel their gifts and their talents and things like that. And that can be just as challenging. And God does that. He channels us. He doesn't just tell us no, he tells us yes. Yes, do this. Yes, live like that. Yes, go through that. Yes, I will be with you in that. He tells us yes. But yes or no by the Father requires that we trust Him. God doesn't have a hair trigger wrath like some dads. And God is not reckless and emotional like some moms. You can switch that around. Mom can be the angry one. Dad could be the emotional one. We're all a mess at some level. God is never a mess. God never makes it. He never hauls off. He never loses control. He never steps outside of His wisdom when relating to us. So true. Finally, as you're probably wondering, when's this sermon going to end? Finally, our adoption is also a matter of eschatology. You guys are all like, oh no, (laughs) we're going to eschatology next. (laughs) It just means, brothers and sisters, if you've been adopted into the family of God, guess what? Like any adopted child, you're going home. You're going to go home to the Father's house. I was, you guys know how much I love doing uh, podcasts and things with uh, Dr. Lane Tipton, who's also a pastor. We were scheduled to do one about a month ago, and he got slammed. Three funerals in a row, week after, one right after another one, week after week after week in his church. Funeral, funeral, funeral. And I said, sorry, man. It just took such a toll on me. It wiped me out. My schedule has just been... But these saints that went home to be with the Lord, these are adopted children that are going home to the Father permanently. They're going to their rightful home to be home with God in His eternal kingdom. And not surprising, that's where we're going next week by the grace of God in this passage. Same eschatological direction, which we will contemplate, Lord willing, next week. Let's pray together. Ask God to bless us. Father, Lord, thank You for Your Word. And thank You for this Word on adoption that gives us such great confidence as God's children that we have all these marvelous privileges set before us. And Lord, we're thankful for that because we know that we in ourselves, Lord, we are often tempted to think that we don't belong anywhere. Nobody loves us. Maybe nobody likes us. We may be easily susceptible, many of us, to feel lonely as if we don't have true friendship, true relationship. And as much as we are to find our refuge in You as our Father, as much as we are to find our belonging in the Kingdom of God, we pray that we would find belonging in the Church of God as well. And each one of us, Lord, has the equal 
blessing of adoption and responsibility of adoption. We are blessed because we belong. But we have a responsibility to bless those that belong. And so help us, Lord, to reach out, to, do, to outdo evil with good. That when loneliness or separation or, or when, when we feel isolated and we're tempted to turn that into some toxic attitude, help us to reach out and bless others because in refreshing others, we ourselves will be refreshed. And so help us, Lord, to be imitators of you, even as we sacrificially love. In Jesus' name and for his sake, amen.